Good evening. I'm here to talk to you today about congenital cervical stenosis in athletes and make the case that an athlete who has congenital cervical stenosis, who has symptoms, cannot go back to play. These are my disclosures. None are relevant to this talk. This is actually the dreaded scenario. Uh, most of us who take care of athletes with spine problems don't want to see this head down tackle into another player where a player is left on the field, either unconscious or uh, paralyzed or uh, having, bio, having neurologic symptoms. Then we see the dreaded waving of the arms that something significantly is wrong. So what is congenital cervical stenosis? Congenital cervical stenosis is associated with certain measurements of canal diameters. Uh, and really a normal canal diameter is above 13 millimeters. And this has been done in lots of different studies looking at what is the lower limit of normal um, uh, for that you go below, we call that congenital cervical stenosis. And it's below 12 and a half to 13 millimeters. This is typically, so the kinds of injuries that are associated with a congenital cervical stenosis is a cervical cord neuropraxia, where an athlete has acute transient neurologic symptoms of cord neuro origin. The patterns of involvement typically are both arms, both legs, an arm and a leg, two arms and a leg, what have you. These can be sensory symptoms with or without motor changes. They could be uh, burning, numbness, or tingling, it could be weakness, it could be paralysis, it could be plegia, it could be any of the above. The episodes could last from a few seconds to minutes to hours. And the longer the episode, the longer it takes to get better. And remember, by definition, there must be a complete return of normal neurologic function and full painless range of motion. Dr. Torg identified the, the relationship between uh, neuropraxia of the cervical spine with transient quadriplegia and postulated a developmental uh, narrowing of the cervical canal may be a, an important link to this problem. He identified an imaging marker, his TORG ratio, where, the, where you, we measure the spinal canal, A, divided by the vertebral body, B, and it's pathologic less than 0 0.8. He did an important study where he looked at five groups of athletes, 227 asymptomatic college football players, 97 asymptomatic professional football players, 45 high school, college, and professional football players that had at least one episode of a cord neuropraxia, 77 former football players that were quads secondary to football injuries, and 105 male non-athletes. Here you can see in this, in this, in this graph, uh, looking at spinal canal diameters, looking at in the green here, these are patients who had a witness cord neuropraxia, but notice up here, the quads are up here. And then most of the athletes are all up here, except for the cord neuropraxias are down here. Uh, looking at the vertebral body sizes, obviously the control with the non-athletes tended to have the smallest vertebral body sizes. Um, and the, all the others were sort of above. The quads had intermediate sized vertebral body, but significantly smaller than the active players. The TORG ratios, however, had the lowest ratios in the athletes that had cord neuropraxias. But notice the quad with this blue line up here. And so the, the, the cord neuropraxias tended to have the smallest TORG ratios. The ratio was very sensitive, but very nonspecific, therefore making it a poor test to screen for those at risk. So developmental narrowing of the canal in and of itself without any symptoms shouldn't preclude an athlete from participation. And note, none of the 77 athletes in the study who were quads ever recalled a pre-injury incident of a cord neuropraxia. And none of, the 20, none of the 22 of 45 athletes who returned to play had any permanent neurologic injury at least one, year, one season of follow-up. He, he continued to follow these athletes. He looked at another group of 110 individuals who had a cord neuropraxia and said, and, and, and within this group, these all had developmental narrowing of the canal. They had TORG ratios of about 0 0.68, disc level canal diameters of 10.1. Of these 110, there were no significant distant, uh, differences in their, in their age, 
sex, type of sport, coordinate of praxia, clinical grade, or radiographic findings. Of the 63 athletes who returned after a single episode of a coordinate of praxia, half of them had another one. And the average number of recurrences was at least three and a range extending upwards of 25. Obviously, the risk of recurrent coordinate apraxia was more likely if you played, played contact or collision sports than other sports. All radiographic measurements, with the exception of actual diameter of the spinal cord, were predictors of recurrence. The bigger your disc level canal diameter, the less likely it recurred. The higher your torque ratio, the less likely it recurred. And they continued to follow these studies for years. And no patient involved in the study ever had a permanent neurologic injury secondary to contact athletics. The key point is that cord neuropraxies are transient and cord compression is related to the sagittal diameter of the spinal canal. So who, what, what could happen here? Patients who have a cord neuropraxia who don't have congenital spinal stenosis can return. However, those who have a cord neuropraxia should be advised there's a very good chance it's gonna happen again, greater than 50%. And the smaller your canal, the less likely they should be going back. And we usually say you could have one or two of these before it becomes an absolute contraindication. Developmental stenosis or congenital stenosis is a, without any symptoms is not a contraindication, but once you've had something, you should be pulled from play. Other contraindication, no contraindication. If you have a disc herniation, you had a cord neuropraxia from that and it healed and went away, you don't have to have uh, to be pulled from play. How, or if you had a one level discectomy infusion, you had a cord neuropraxia. Cord neuropraxia, when you have any MRI evidence of, of cord edema, neurologic abnormality lasting greater than 36 hours of multiple occurrences, absolute contraindication to playing. Another thing we sometimes see are patients who have something called the spear tackler spine, where they've had, they have developmental stenosis, they've lost their lordosis, and they have um, uh, witnessed episodes of improper tackling technique. The conclusion, why roll the dice? Common sense that dictates that a recurrent cord neuropraxia may be the harbinger of a more significant spinal cord injury at some point. Most of us will remove an athlete after one or two episodes of this from continued play. Thank you very much.